talk for um, <laughs> just to let you guys know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, <laughs> Um, I'll try and talk for about 35 to 40 minutes today and then allow for, for 20 or so minutes of questions and discussion at the end. Um, I'll be presenting the highlights of what we learned um, in this project. So um, I won't go over all the details, but there will be a recording available afterwards. Um, and we will post a report of this on our website as, with more details as soon as that's ready. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go over the why of the study, so a bit about the background. I'll go over um, research questions and goals, um, some about the methodology, then I'll get to the results. And we had three sections in our results, so barriers, facilitators, and a bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, then I'll talk about the significance and conclusions of our study. And then finally, we'll, we'll get to questions. There we go. So um, first I'll give a little bit of background on why we focused on advanced care planning and community based organizations. So advanced care planning is a process by which patients think about and share their values, goals and preferences as they relate to their future future health care. And um, ACP or advanced care planning conversations are associated with increased patient and family satisfaction as well as decreased patient anxiety and depression and reduced hospital deaths. However, rates of ACP engagement remain low in BC. Um, and community-based organizations, so here we're talking about organizations such as hospice societies, senior centers, faith-based organizations, disease-specific organizations, and, and many more, um, can offer accessible ACP services to their communities. And the role and importance of these organizations in ACP has become increasingly recognized, um, especially as the importance of a public health approach to ACP is acknowledged. Um, involving community organizations in ACP work can lead to better targeting of ACP education to marginalized populations. It can better normalize ACP and it can spare the health system time and money. However, research into um, barriers and facilitators to advanced care planning um, has traditionally focused on healthcare providers and patients. So not what much work has been done around advanced care planning and community-based organizations in particular. Let's see. Slides are, slides are a little slow here. There we go. Oops. I'm back. Um, so why is the BC Center for Palliative Care doing this project? Um, the BC Center for Palliative Care, or BCCPC, um, strives, strives to support community organizations in BC who are doing ACP work and other related work. Um, so we continue to support community organizations with ACP work through initiatives like the SEED grants, um, the Compassionate Communities Toolkit, the Facilitator Training for Public um, ACP Information Sessions, and the Conversation Game Sharing, as well as hosting ACP resources on our website that are specifically geared at community organizations. And we've also learned through our work with you, um, with many of you rather, as community organizations that you do experience barriers in your work with advanced care planning and you also have many ideas as to how um, this might be mitigated or improved. So a little bit about probably a review for most of you about advanced care planning in BC. Um, in BC, the legal options for advanced care planning are a representation agreement and an advanced directive. And both of these came into effect in 2011. Um, a no CPR form and a medical order scope of treatment form um, or a most form are physician orders that are prevalent in BC health authorities. Um, so their name and their details vary in different authorities. Um, and these are tools for physicians to indicate the level of care a patient re should receive in an emergency based, um, based on a discussion with the patient and their substitute decision maker. So the most, guide, most form builds on the no CPR form. And um, in, finally, in early 2013, um, the, the My Voice ACP guide was released um, in response to the representation agreement. And this um, My Voice guide is BC's first provincial ACP guide. 
Okay, so um, what were we asking for, our, for, for this project? So we had three, three questions that we were asking. So from a BC community-based organization perspective, the first question was, what are the most important barriers to address in order to increase ACP engagement? Then we asked, what are the most important actions to take or facilitators in order to increase ACP engagement? And finally, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed ACP needs? And if so, how can community-based organizations be helped in supporting their communities with these needs? So with these questions, we were aiming to better understand the perspectives and roles of community organizations in advanced care planning in BC. And through this greater understanding, we hope to enable organizations in BC who are advocating for ACP to tailor their funding and initiatives towards what can best support these community-based organizations in their um, ACP-related work. And to give you some, some examples, this means that um, the BCCPC might use this to, to, to tailor funding and initiatives, as well as organizations like the CHPCA, policymakers, you know, government health authorities. And finally, um, we'd be interested to know from community organizations, you know, what, what's, what is your view on this work and what, um, what might come up out of it for you? So a little bit about our methodology. Um, we used a mixed methods approach for this project. So we had an online survey, um, we had an online survey and interviews and the online survey was open in June and July of this year and it was distributed via email um, to organizations that were known to be engaging in, in ACP work. Um, we distributed one survey to active community organization contacts and then we distributed another very similar survey um, to inactive contacts and also new contacts that we reached out to. Um, then we did one-on-one -on -one phone interviews with those who indicated interest in the survey. A little bit more about the survey. Um, so participants in the survey were asked to rank lists of barriers and facilitators. Um, the list of barriers um, was developed by an informal review of recent Canadian literature on barriers to advanced care planning from a non-healthcare pr provider perspective. So we took the most frequently mentioned barriers from this review and we had 16 of them. Our, facil our facilitators um, were developed using the action items from the recent pan-Canadian framework. Um, so to give you a little bit more of an idea about this. In late 2019, the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association, Association CHPCA, released an updated pan-Canadian framework for advanced care planning in Canada. Um, and this framework prevent, presents an unprioritized list of actions through which to improve and increase ACP across the country. Um, so we took 33 of these actions and used those as our facilitators. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this framework later. Um, and then from those barriers and facilitators, we had participants select the ones that they found most important and then rank among those. In terms of the interviews, um, the interviews were designed to delve deeper into the same questions that were covered by the online survey. And we, we analyzed both the interviews and the long answer questions using NVivo 12, which is a qualitative software. There we go. So getting to the results now. Um, so we had 57 survey responses, which we were quite pleased with. Um, 42 of these were existing contacts and 15 of these were new or inactive contacts of the BC Center for Palliative Care. Um, we conducted 17 one-on-one -on -one interviews. And as you can see below, the responses um, were mostly from three types of organizations. So hospices, organizations supporting seniors and organizations supporting people affected by a specific disease. We had participants um, from across the province with the majority of participants from, the Van from Vancouver Island region and the interior region. So you can see the breakup of who um, was from the survey and the interview there. Okay, um, now uh, we're getting into our quantitative results and we'll talk first about the barriers. So um, I'll, I'll tell you first about the quantitative barriers. So the barriers ranked on the survey, then we'll talk about the qualitative barriers. So the barriers derived through the interview and the long answer questions. And then I'll talk briefly about how these compare. So you can see here that I've listed the top four ba quantitative barriers. Um, and you can see that these top four are clearly quite a bit um, 
ranked quite a bit higher than, than the rest of the list. Um, so they were clear winners. Um, so the first one is complete, the complete lack of awareness of advanced care planning on the part of the individual. Then we have the emotional difficulty of the conversation. Then we have the individual's confusion or lack of knowledge about how to begin or perform advanced care planning. And then finally, the belief that advanced care planning is a one-time conversation to specify a do not resuscitate designation. So um, moving on to qualitative barriers, um, and I'll be talking here about the barriers that occurred most frequently in participants' long answer and interview responses. So these are in no particular order, and I'll talk about four, four main ones. So first of all, the confusing ACP process. So the quote for this is, the 50 page My Voice Guide is overwhelming. It's overwhelming for someone who is in their 80s and is still in good health. It's a little bit much. So um, the confusing ACP process contributed to the public's lack of knowledge about advanced care planning in a number of ways. So first of all, there was confusing terminology. So frequent changes in terminology and many different terms. And then there was confusing process, so many different steps. In particular, there was felt to be confusion for both members of the public and healthcare providers between ACP and then ACP related options. So the do not resuscitate designation, the legal will, the most form, et cetera. And this confusion was felt to decrease the number of people who were open to discussing advanced care planning and to prevent those conversations from occurring. As the quote above indicates, there was also a lot of frustration um, to do with the length and complexity of the current My Voice Guide, but people still felt obligated to use it because of its official nature, so they were hesitant to use other sources. The second qualitative barrier um, is the emotional difficulty of the conversation. So the quote for this is, the biggest barrier is the emotional difficulty of the conversation. The actual fear of death is the biggest thing that's stopping people. So many participants described a death denying culture in which people refuse to recognize their mortality and therefore see ACP as irrelevant. Um, and when people in this death denying culture are forced to confront their mortality, they often do so with fear, causing them to resist topics um, around end of life or discussing topics um, around end of life. And occasionally, um, people noted that this fear could provide a catalyst for advanced care planning conversations. And one example um, was given uh, COVID as an example. Um, several participants felt that this fear prevented engagement with and completion of ACP, even in members of the public who had been educated about it. Um, and this fear was not restricted to members of the public. It was also true for healthcare providers, although not for um, nonprofits and community organizations. The third qualitative barrier. Um, ACP is a challenge to present in different cultural contexts. Um, the quote for this is, a lot of places it's a cultural decision, it's a family decision, how you move forward in terms of treatment, and we don't necessarily recognize this or that. <laughs> so um, advanced care planning education and materials need to be adjusted for different populations, and this often presented a challenge for advanced care planning providers and resulted in the, in the delivery of advanced care planning education that was subpar or ineffectual. And this was particularly relevant to what was seen as one size fits all provincial resources. Okay, our final, our final qualitative barrier here, um, is difficulties collaborating with the healthcare system and healthcare providers. So the quote here is, the health authority is quite territorial and they don't think outside the box. They don't think that other agencies can provide these services. And a lot of times they don't look at us as an enhancement. I mean, it's volunteer time. It doesn't cost the healthcare system anything. So really a big aspect here was poor communication. So participants had difficulty accessing up-to-date information about advanced care planning from health authorities. Many didn't know how exactly ACP was being conducted within the healthcare system. And then there was anxiety that they were duplicating efforts or distributing contradictory information. In addition, um, the, the slower speed and hierarchical nature of the health authority administrations um, were felt to hold back community-based organizations, ACP efforts, um, and innovations. 
participants also expressed frustration with some healthcare, with some health authorities seemingly seeming lack of interest in collaboration, excuse me. So many reported that there was little interest or knowledge um, on the part of the health authorities in what the, not, the, the, um, the community organizations were offering. And then even when healthcare providers expressed interest in advanced care planning, particip participants believed that time constraints made it um, very difficult for healthcare providers to carry out ACP satisfactorily. So those are the four qualitative barriers that we found to, or four largest qualitative barriers that we found to advanced care planning. There's a quick summary for you. And then um, I'll talk a little bit now about how, how they compare to our quantitative barriers. Um, so as you can see, the first quantitative barrier was the complete lack of awareness of advanced care planning on the part of the individual. This didn't really come up in the interviews, so it wasn't a major qualitative barrier. Um, the emotional difficulty of the conversation was seen clearly in both. Um, the confusion or lack of knowledge about how to begin or perform ACP on the part of the individual, as well as the barrier below that, the belief that advanced care planning is a one-time conversation, were both, um, we put those both together in confusing ACP process. So those were both found in the qualitative section. Um, and then moving over to the qualitative side now, ACP is a challenge to present in different cultural contexts. Um, similar options, but not exact options were given in our quantitative survey. So that may have influenced the fact that that wasn't a major bar quantitative barrier. And then finally, difficulties collaborating with the healthcare system and healthcare providers um, was a new qualitative finding. So that didn't come up um, as a major barrier in our review of um, recent Canadian literature. So, so that was new. Oops, excuse me. <laughs> so now we're on to facilitators. Um, so again, these are the, I'll talk about the quantitative facilitators and then the qualitative ones, and then I'll talk about how they compare. Um, the facilitators, the top facilitators, um, are, were develop clear and simple messages with and for target audiences, improve a ACP literacy, reframe advanced care planning as part of life planning, and simplify the documenting and transferring of advanced care planning conversations. Um, and again, these four, these four were, were clear winners. They were ranked much higher than, than the other options. Um, just as a, as a little bit of an aside, um, again, we developed these facilitators from the Pan-Canadian Framework. And the Pan-Canadian Framework, in listing out all of its facilitative actions, divided them into four pillars, which were engage and edu educate all stakeholders, extend the partnership network, build supportive systems, and measure impact. And the top three facilitators that you're seeing here were all from the engage and educate all stakeholders pillar. So these were the engaging and educate all stakeholders pillar was um, seen as the most important pillar for community organizations out of the framework. Okay, so, oops, that's a preview. Um, <laughs> the first qualitative barrier um, that we'll talk about, and again, these are in no particular order, um, is simplify documenting and transferring ACP conversations. And the quote accompanying this is, it should be all electronic right now and the advanced care plan stuff isn't yet in the electronic filing system. So right now there's sort of this void. They say everyone should go to their family doctor but they have no capacity to deal with this. They don't even have a form. They don't know anything about it. So participants strongly felt that ACP needed to be streamlined so that it was accessible when needed. And this means documenting ACP electronically, electronically training healthcare providers in how to document um, and ensuring that this documentation is available across hospitals and clinics in BC. And the simplified documentation and transfer was seen to decrease confusion around the ACP process and terminologies for both the public and healthcare providers. So um, our second qualitative facilitator is improve advanced care planning literacy by providing more education to healthcare providers. So the quote here is, if the doctors all were up on the most form, that would be great. 
but they're not. So in terms of basic education for healthcare providers, there were a variety of responses. So in some, communicated, so in some communities, um, participants were working on getting doctors even aware of and using most forms. So you can see that in this quote. Um, in other communities, the distinction between the most form and advanced care planning was felt to be very important um, and needed. Um, healthcare providers were also felt to be, ne they needed better education on how to tactfully carry out ACP conversations. And many expressed a desire for family physicians in particular to take a greater leadership role in the, in the initiation of ACP conversations. Finally, um, community organizations wanted healthcare providers to be better informed about the roles and capabilities of community organizations in order to facilitate collaboration. So that was our, sec our second qualitative facilitator. Oh, there we go. Oops, excuse me. So our third qualitative facilitator is improve ACP literacy by making use of ACP education delivered by community-based organizations. And the quote here is, sometimes I'll ask an elder to share a story of their experience in the hospital, and I do some pre-work with them first so that they know, so they know to talk about what they wish they would have known in different things. And I think when they hear about it coming from an elder about how things could have been done differently, that's how I introduce the topic of ACP. And I find it's different in every community I work in. So participants believe themselves well equipped to deliver high quality um, advanced care planning education to the public. Um, and they saw many advantages to the ACP education that was delivered by community based organization. Um, this included its accessibility and its ability to tailor initiatives to local cultures and many, many examples of community organizations tailoring ACP to their culture to their local cultures were given. Um, Including community organizations also enables the reframing of ACP as part of life planning. So this idea of incorporating ACP throughout the life process um, was seen as by, by many as key to addressing the emotional barrier of advanced care planning. And our final qualitative facilitator, just give me a sec. Um, was developing clear and simple messages. So here we have, we need a simpler booklet that could be handed out to the public. My voice is too long and very difficult to follow. So participants wanted an official central ACP tool that was shorter, clearer, and more comprehensive than the current provincial ACP guide. Um, and this guide would address confusion related to ACP process and terminology. And again, people, participants felt like they should be using the official tool. And so they wanted that um, clearer um, official tool. And here are your um, qualitative facilitators. Again, that's a summary of those. Okay, so now to compare the quantitative and the qualitative facilitators. So these um, paired up quite nicely. So develop clear, simple messages um, was, was found to be a major facilitator for both. Um, improving ACP literacy um, kind of fell into two categories of our qualitative barriers, both improving ACP literacy by providing more education to healthcare providers and improving ACP literacy by making use of education delivered by community-based organizations. Um, reframing ACP as part of life planning was also found in the qualitative um, facilitators and we, we put it under the improving ACP literacy by making use of education delivered by community-based organizations. And then finally, um, simplifying the documenting and transferring of ACP conversations was found um, in both to be important. So um, this survey was open um, in June and July of this year. So obviously we're, we were, uh, you know, um, doing this project during a pandemic. So we asked some questions um, concerning, concerning ACP delivery and COVID-19. Um, and the first question that we asked was, is ACP a priority? 
Um, so specifically is delivering ACP information right now and facilitating ACP conversations a priority for your organization right now given the pandemic? Um, and we had a pretty even split. So, so about half of people said, yes, it is a priority. Um, some respondents said that had, it had always been a priority, had always been a priority. Others um, had increased their ACP programming to mirror the increase in public awareness of serious illness and death. And then about half of respondents said, no, um, ACP is not a priority for us. Many felt that they did not have the bandwidth for ACP work. Um, some felt that they were concentrating on other emergent matters such as social, social isolation. And then many just didn't have the abil ability to prioritize advanced care planning given the in-person nature of um, much advanced care planning programming. So the next question we asked was, have ACP needs changed? And particularly, have ACP needs changed in your community because of COVID? So here we had about a third of people said, yes, ACP needs have changed. Um, many believed that the crisis had increased public awareness and dialogue about end of life. Um, and this change in awareness was generally considered to be a positive development, even though it was seen to have come from a place of fear. In particular, the increase in home deaths was described as a major instigator for ACP conversations. Then two thirds um, of respondents said no, um, ACP needs have not changed. Some cited a lack of COVID cases in their area. Um, others noted that there had always been a strong need um, for ACP and so it hadn't changed because of that. Um, and then worth noting also that um, we had several participants say that COVID restrictions had made it harder for them to get a grasp on, on their communities, to be in touch with their communities. And so many were uncertain about their responses here. Um, and then finally, we asked about um, what, would, what would help your community, what would, um, <laughs> What would help your organization support your community um, with advanced care planning with regards to COVID-19? And so we heard about some of the difficulties and some of the innovations um, in delivering ACP in a pandemic. So the difficulties included um, that uh, there were no in-person se sessions permitted and both ACP and ACP education are typically delivered in person, either by workshops or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so one, per one person said this kind of stopped everything in its tracks and lots of people had that feeling. Um, the inability to have in-person meetings also made it more difficult to include family in these conversations. And then uh, many were, many, Participants were hesitant to consider moving their programming online, seeing online education as subpar or unable to reach their target audiences, most of whom were older. Um, we also talked to, talked to many people who had um, innovated in order to keep delivering their program. Um, so several organizations had already organized successful online ACP workshops, and this is particularly impressive given that, you know, we did this in the summer, so that's a, that's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and these workshops took a variety of forms, including publicizing online workshops from other organizations, um, Facebook Live workshops, um, you know, some people were distributing, promoting ACP through distributing posters, creating radio advertisements, sending out informative surveys, um, and then um, People also, participants also um, noted that collaborations were happening more quickly and easily for many um, with, some, um, with some reporting being reached out um, to by physicians and other healthcare professionals to act as community resources. So um, now we'll talk about the significance of our study. Um, so, to our knowledge, um, and I'll talk first about the approach. So to our knowledge, this is the first study to rank community-based, to rank community-based nonprofit perspectives of barriers and facilitators to advanced care planning. Although there have been some studies that have combined community organization and public perspectives or community organization and healthcare perspectives. So the closest project that we could find um, to, to this one was a 2019 survey of the Canadian public with provincial breakdowns. And this was a, a survey conducted by BCHPCA. And this survey also asked participants to rank barriers and facilitators. 
and they really reported similar top barriers and facilitators um, to ours. Um, however, they found that more personal time to reflect on my wishes was a top facilitator for the public. And um, this was not a concept that was included in the national ACP framework, and it was not a concept that was included in our interviews. So it's worth questioning whether more personal time to reflect on my wishes may be a barrier to advanced care planning for the BC public that remains unrecognized by those um, with ex expertise in the ACP field, including um, community-based organizations. Um, next, um, nonprofits have significant difficulty collaborating with health authorities. So this issue is not new. Um, international studies have explored how to promote collaboration between nonprofits and healthcare systems. Um, and um, a 2019 environmental scan of caregiver support resources provided by BC hospices also found that hospices had trouble keeping up to date with health authorities. So this general idea is not new. However, the desire of many community-based organizations to be involved in ACP organization, and then the lack of receptivity of health authorities are, we believe, new nuances to this concept of nonprofit or community-based organization and health system collaboration. Um, healthcare provider education was seen to be key to this better, to, to fostering better collaboration, and participants were eager to volunteer ideas for what forms this collaboration might take. Oops. Excuse me. <laughs> um, next, frustration um, with current provincial ACP materials, so in particular my voice, is frequent with the wish for development of materials with clearer and simpler messages. So the, again, the My Voice Guide was considered the ACP resource that people should be using despite its issues. Um, and there have been a number of studies showing that clear advanced care planning educational resources can improve ACP um, rates, especially when used in conjunction with counseling. So this may indeed um, be a fix or, or a patch. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, reframing advanced care planning as part of life planning may be a solution to this discomfort associated with end of life discussions and nonprofits are suited to support this. First, um, it's worth noting that most participants we talked to closely associated advanced care planning with end of life. And this correlation of advanced care planning with end of life is slightly at odds with the recent consensus definitions of advanced care planning, which describe it as a process of communicating personal values, life goals, and preferences for use during any future medical care, including serious and chronic illness. So there is a potential that loosening this correlation between advanced care planning and end of life um, could, could be a potential mitigator. However, in the present, advanced care planning remains closely associated with end of life um, and community organizations are uniquely suited to facilitate and support this hurdle of reframing ACP as part of life planning. Um, do, and this is due to their knowledge of their communities and their accessibility. And indeed, many nonprofits we talk to are already engaged in normalizing end of life conversations. So our conclusions, including the voices and needs of community organizations is necessary to fully incorporate them into ACP processes. Their inclusion can continue to offer novel and effective ways to increase and improve ACP in BC and beyond. Second, um, change at a healthcare system or governmental level is important in order to fully realize the benefits of including community organizations in the ACP process. And then finally, the COVID-19 pandemic has made some aspects of ACP education more difficult for organizations. And it's important to support nonprofits with ways to deliver ACP content online, such as online trainings for staff, assistant in setting up online workshops and video creation. So um, we've reached the point, I'm, I'm, I'm done my presenting bit. Um, so now we'd love to hear from you. Um, so, so please feel free to have a look at these questions um, and let us know. Um, so is anything missing? Is anything surprising? Um, how will this impact your practice? 
Um, so please, if you have anything to say, we'd love to hear from you.